Om Sai Ram, Chapter 2 Object of writing the work in capacity and boldness in the undertaking. Hot discussion, conferring significant and prophetic title of Hemadpad, necessity of a guru. In the last chapter, the author mentioned in the original Marathi book that he would state the reason that led him to undertake the work and about the persons qualified to read the same and such other points. Now, in this chapter, he narrates the same. The object of writing this work. In the first chapter, I described Sai Baba's miracle of checking and destroying the cholera epidemic by grinding wheat and throwing the flour on the outskirts of the village. I heard other miracles of Sai Baba to my great delight and this delight burst forth into this poetic work. I also thought that the description of these miracles of Sai Baba would be interesting and instructive to his devotees and would remove their sins and so I began to write the sacred life and teachings of Sai Baba. The life of the saint is neither logical nor dialectical. It shows us the true and great path. Incapacity and boldness in undertaking the work. Hemadman thought that he was not a fit person to undertake the work. He said, I do not know the life of my intimate friend nor do I know my own mind. Then how can I write the life of a saint or describe the nature of incarnations which even the Vedas were unable to do? One must be a saint himself before he could know other saints. Otherwise, how can I describe their glory? To write the life of a saint is most difficult. One may as well be able to measure the depth of the seven seas or enclose the sky with cloth trappings. I knew this was the most venturous undertaking which might expose me to ridicule. I therefore invoked Sai Baba's grace. The premier poet, saint of Maharashtra, Sri Dhyaneshwar Maharaj, has stated that the Lord loves those who write the lives of saints and the saints also have their own peculiar method of assigning the service which the devotees long for. The saint inspires the work, the devotee becomes only an indirect cause or an instrument in achieving the end. For instance, in 1700 Shaka year, the poet Mahipati aspired to write the lives of saints. Saints inspired him and got the work done. So also, in 1800 Shaka year, thus Ganu's service was accepted. The former wrote four works, Bhakta Vijaya, Santa Vijaya, Bhakta Lilamrit and Santa Lilamrit, while the latter wrote two. Bhakta Lilamrit and Santa Kantamrit, in which the lives of modern saints were described. In chapter 31, 32, 33 of Bhakta Lilamrit and in chapter 57 of Santa Kantamrit, the life and teachings of Sai Baba are very well depicted. These have been separately published in Sai Lila magazine, numbers 11 and 12, volume 17. The readers are advised to read these chapters. So also, Sai Baba's wonderful Leelas are described by Mrs. Savitri Bhai Raghunath Tendulkar of Bandra in a small book named Sri Sainath Bhajan Mala. Das Ganu Maharaj also has composed various sweet poems on, on Sai Baba. A devotee named Amidas Bhavani Mehta has also published some stories of Sai Baba in Gujarati. Some numbers of Sainath Prabha, a magazine published by Dakshina Bhiksha Sanstha of Shirdi, are also published. Then the question of objection comes in that while so many works regarding Sai Baba are extant, why should this Sai Satcharitra be written and where is its necessity? The answer is plain and simple. The life of Sai Baba is a wide and deep as the infinite ocean and all can dive deep into the same and take out precious gems of knowledge and bhakti and distribute them among the aspiring people. The stories, parables and teachings of Sai Baba are very wonderful. They will give peace and happiness to the people who are afflicted 
with sorrows and heavily loaded with miseries of this worldly existence and also bestow knowledge and wisdom both in worldly and in spiritual domains if these teachings of sai baba which are as interesting and instructive as the vedic lore are listened to and meditated upon the devotees will get what they long for like union with brahma mastery in eight fold yoga bliss of meditation etc so i thought that i should call these stories together that would be my best upasana this collection would be most delightful to those simple souls whose eyes are not blessed with sai baba's darshan so i set about collecting sai baba's teachings and expressions the outcome of his boundless self realization it was sai baba who inspired me in this matter in fact i surrendered my ego at his feet and thought that my path was clear and that he would make me quite happy here and in the next world i could not myself ask sai baba to give me permission for this work so i requested mr madhavrao deshpande alai shama baba's most intimate devotee to speak to him for me he pleaded my cause and said to sai baba this anna sahib wishes to write your biography don't say that you are a poor fakir and there is no necessity to write it but if you agree and help him he will write or rather your grace will accomplish the work without your consent and blessing nothing can be done successfully when sai baba heard this request he was moved and blessed me by giving me his uddi sacred ash and placing his boon bestowing hand on my head said let him make a collection of stories and experiences keep notes and memos i will help him he is only an outward instrument i should write my autobiography myself and satisfy the wishes of my devotees he should get rid of his ego surrender it at my feet he who acts like this in life i help him the most what of my life stories i serve him in his house in all possible ways when his ego is completely annihilated and there is left no trace of it i myself shall enter into him and shall myself write my own life hearing my stories and teachings will create faith in devotees hearts and they will easily get self realization and bliss let there be no insistence on establishing one's own view no attempt to refute others opinions no discussion of pros and cons of any subject significant and prophetic title the word discussion put me in mind of my promise to explain the story of my getting the title of hemat pant and now i begin to relate the same i was on close friendly terms with kaka sahib dikshit and nana sahib chandrokar they pressed me to go to shirdi and have baba's darshan and i promised them to do so but something in the meanwhile turned up which prevented me from going to shirdi the son of a friend of mine at lonavala fell ill my friend tried all possible means physical and spiritual but the fever would not abate at length he got his guru to sit by the bedside of his son but this too was of no avail hearing this i thought what was the utility of the guru if he could not save my friend's son if the guru can't do anything for us why should i go to shirdi at all thinking this way i postponed my shirdi trip but the inevitable must happen and it happened in my case as follows mr nana sahib chandorkar who was a divisional officer was going on tour to basin from tana he came to dadar and was waiting for a train bound for basin meanwhile a bandra local turned up he sat in it and came to bandra and sent for me and took me to task for putting off my shirdi trip nana's argument for my shirdi trip was convincing 
and delightful and so I decided to start for Shirdi the same night. I packed up my luggage and started for Shirdi. I planned to go to Dadar and from there he to catch the train for Manmad and so I booked myself for Dadar and sat in the train. While the train was to start, a Mohammedan came hastily to my compartment and seeing all my paraphernalia, asked me where I was bound to. I told him about my plan. He then suggested that I should go straight to Bodbundar and not to wait at Dadar as the Manmad mail did not stop at Dadar. If this little miracle or Leela had not happened, I would not have reached Shirdi next day as settled and many doubts would have assailed me. But that was not to be. As fortune favoured me, I reached Shirdi the next day before 9 or 10 a.m. Babu Sahib Kaka Dikshit was waiting for me there. This was in 1910 when there was only one place like Satya's Vada for lodging pilgrim devotees. After alighting from the Tanga, I was anxious to have darshan when the great devotee Tatya Sahib Nulkar returned from the masjid and said that Sai Baba was at the corner of the Vada and that I should first get the preliminary darshan and then after bath see him at leisure. Hearing this, I ran and prostrated before Baba and my joy knew no bounds. I found more than what Nana Chandrakar had told me. All my senses were satisfied and I forgot my thirst and hunger. The moment I touched Sai Baba's feet, I began a new lease of life. I felt myself much obliged to those who spurred and helped me to get the darshan and I considered them as my real relatives and I cannot repay their debt. I only remember them and prostrate mentally before them. The peculiarity of Sai Baba's darshan as I found it is that by his darshan our thoughts are changed, the force of previous actions is abated and gradually non-attachment or dispassion towards worldly objects grows up. It is by the merit of actions in many past births that such darshan is got and if only you see Sai Baba, all the world assumes the form of Sai Baba. Hot Discussion on the first day of my arrival in Shirdi, there was a discussion between me and Bala Sahib Bhatte regarding the necessity of a Guru. I contended, why should we lose our freedom and submit to others? When we have to do our duty, why a Guru is necessary? One must try his best and save himself. What can the Guru do to a man who does nothing but sleeps indolently? Thus, I pleaded free will while Mr. Bhatte took up the other side, like destiny, and said, Whatever is bound to happen must happen. Even great men have failed. Man proposes one way, but God disposes the other way. Brush aside your cleverness. Pride or egoism won't help you. This discussion, with all its pros and cons, went on for an hour or so, and as usual, no conclusion was arrived at. We had to stop the discussion ultimately as we were exhausted. The net result of this was that I lost my peace of mind and found that unless there is strong body consciousness and egoism, there would be no discussion. In other words, it is egoism which breeds discussion. Then when we went to the masjid with others, Baba asked Kaka Sahib Dikshit the following. What was going on in the Satya's Vada? What was the discussion about? And staring at me, Baba further added, What did this Hemad Pan say? Hearing these words, I was much surprised. The masjid was at a considerable distance from Satya Vada, where I was staying and where the discussion was going on. How could Baba know our discussion unless he is omniscient and inner ruler of us all? I began to think why Sai Baba should call me by the name Hemad Pant. This word is a distorted form of Hemadri Pant. This Hemadri Pant was a well-known minister of the kings Mahadev 
and Ramadev of Devagiri of the Yadav dynasty. He was very learned, good natured, and the author of the works such as Chaturvarga Chintamani, dealing with the spiritual subjects, and Raj Prashati. He invented and started new methods of accounts and was the originator of the Mudi, Marathi shorthand script. But I was quite the opposite, an enormous and of mediocre intellect. So I could not understand why the name or title was conferred upon me. But thinking seriously upon it, I thought that the little was a dart to destroy my ego so that I should always remain meek and humble. It was also a compliment paid to me for the cleverness in the discussion. Looking into history, we think that Baba's word calling Mr. Dabholkar by the name Hemadbind was significant and prophetic as we find that he looked after the management of Sai Sansthan very intelligently, kept all the accounts properly and was also the author of such a good work Sai Satcharitra which deals with such important and spiritual subjects as Dhyan, Bhakti, Dispassion, Self-Surrender and Self-Realization. About the necessity of a Guru Hemadpant has left no note, no memo about what Baba said regarding this subject but Kaka Sahib Dikshid has published his notes regarding this matter. Next day, after Hemadpant's meeting with Sai Baba, Kaka Sahib went to Baba and asked Baba where to go. Baba said high up. Then the man said, where is the way? Baba said, there are many ways leading there. There is one way from here, Shirdi also. The way is difficult. There are tigers and wolves in the jungles on the way. I, Kaka Sahib asked, but Baba, what if we take a guide with us? Baba answered, then there is no difficulty. The guide will take you straight to your destination, avoiding wolves, tigers and ditches on the way. If there be no guide, there is the danger of you being lost in the jungles or falling into ditches. Mr. Dabholkar was present on this occasion and he thought that this was the answer Baba gave to the question whether Guru was a necessity. And he thereupon took the hint that no discussion whether man is free or bound is of any use in spiritual matters, but on the contrary, real Paramartha is possible only as the result of the teachings of the Guru as is illustrated in this chapter of the original work in the instances of great avatars like Ram and Krishna who had to submit themselves to their Gurus, Vashishta and Sandipani respectively for getting self-realization and that the only virtues necessary for such progress are faith and patience. Bow to Sri Sai. Peace be to all.